This is CBC Here and Now. We jump from summer to fall in a few days and likely going to see the first significant snowfall. Now CORE's big legal bill, how the former CEO continued racking up expenses nearly $1 million worth. An incident involving a family pet and an ATV has one hunter calling for more enforcement when it comes to all-terrain vehicles. I mean, today it was my dog. Tomorrow, it's a kid. I'm Jeremy Eaton. I'm going to have that story coming up on Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. We begin tonight with a recent and deadly case of COVID-19 in the province. It's a COVID case that has shocked many. A man in western Newfoundland is dead. We have new details tonight about what exactly happened and how that man died. Here now's Peter Cowan joins us live. So Peter, you were asking the health minister about that this afternoon. What did he say? Yeah, we're st there's still lots of gaps in what's the, the story we've been getting here, Carolyn, and, and that's because of privacy concerns. But I can lay out some new details about exactly what happened. So let's take a look at the latest information. So it is a man in his 60s. He's not a resident of the province, but had an exemption in order to enter. He was coming from Central Africa. And let's break down the timeline of what happened. So on Wednesday, the man traveled into the province and he was pre-symptomatic, which means he didn't have symptoms at the time, but later developed them. The next day, he died while in isolation. It's only after the man's death that he was tested for COVID-19. The minister said today that COVID wasn't the main cause of death. It was a supplemental cause, but that's as much detail as he could provide. Some of the rest of that, to be fair, is an element of curiosity. Uh, and whilst I understand it, uh, we have a responsibility, and, and myself as, as the, the guy who looks after the Public Health uh, Information Act, to make sure that I don't go too far the other way and breach individuals' privacy. So that's the line we walk. So we do also know that a close contact of the man was the newest case. Uh, a woman in her 60s was reported as COVID positive yesterday. Uh, that woman had also traveled from Central Africa and health officials said that all the contact tracing and the testing have been done for these two individuals. Carolyn? Thanks so much, Peter. Well, Bailey White is standing by now with more on this. So Bailey, you were tracking this story as it developed over the weekend and today there's a message for travelers. That's right, Carolyn, and I'll just start by echoing something that uh, Peter Cowan said there because I know there's been a lot of questions about this pre-symptomatic. What does that mean? And again, as Peter said, it simply means that this man who passed away last week, he had no symptoms while he was traveling. He developed them later, so it's different from asymptomatic where there are no symptoms at all. Uh, in terms of that important information for travelers, yes, um, these people, uh, they came on a flight uh, last week, AC604, so that's Air Canada Flight 604, uh, from Toronto to Halifax on Wednesday, September 30th. So if you were on that flight and you sat in rows 13 to 17, you've been asked to self-isolate by the Provincial Department of Health. So again, Air Canada Flight 604 last Wednesday. Uh, there was also another leg of the flight from uh, Halifax to Deer Lake, but everybody who needs to self-isolate from that flight has already been contacted. So if you haven't been contacted, you do not need to worry. Carolyn, uh, there was a lot of confusion in getting this information over the weekend. As you mentioned, uh, some of it came late on Saturday, some came late on Sunday. In fact, it was late Saturday afternoon where one of our journalists reached out to the health department and said, is it correct that there are no new cases? And we were told, yes, that's correct. Then 18 minutes later, there was a new case. So uh, lots of confusion, as I say. Um, Health Minister John Hagee talked about this in the House of Assembly today and he was really fired up. He called our report totally inaccurate. But then he came out, he talked to reporters, he took a totally different tack. He said, you know what, there had been some technical glitches with the website and if you didn't have your question answered, we're sorry and we're going to try to do better. 
And all of this comes just days after another confusing situation. Uh, the confirmed case in Labrador involving a health care worker. What is the latest on that situation? That's right. Well, people will remember this is a woman who traveled from Saskatchewan and she was an essential health care worker uh, after she tested positive. Hundreds of people lined up to get tested in the following day. So you'll recall the rules for essential health care workers are that they're allowed to come in. They're allowed to come straight to work. They don't have to self isolate but they are not allowed to um, be out in public when they're not at work. So in other words, they have to self-isolate. They're not allowed to go to grocery stores and things like that. So you can imagine a lot of people were really angry and upset when they learned that, in fact, she had apparently gone to a couple of stores. Well, it turned out on Friday, the CEO of Labrador Grenfell Health came out. She was on Labrador Morning, and she said, actually, we didn't give her all of the complete information. She might not have known that these were the rules. And, and actually, there was no formalized plan to make sure that she even had groceries. So again, here's Health Minister John Hagee. Every individual who has a travel exemption has in that exemption the information they need to follow the chief medical officer's rules around special measures orders. Um, what employers do on top of that is kind of left to them. Uh, there, obviously, Ms. Brown addressed that last week and said there was an issue. Uh, we verified today that that has been fixed, but independent of that, every person who comes in on a travel exemption to this province gets the information they need to be able to comply with a special measures order. So that's John Hagee saying again, anybody who's coming in should have all of this information. They got it in an email. They can check the links if they're not sure. Uh, but Carolyn, you know that point about just having a plan to get people groceries if they're not allowed to go to the grocery store. You know, Labrador Grenfell Health has been relying on rotational workers, people flying in and out of Labrador for years. This is not something new. So it's really hard to understand how after doing this for years and after being this far into the pandemic, there's still no firm plan to get people fed. All right. Thanks so much, Bailey. That's the CBC's Bailey White reporting live tonight. What a difference from Saturday to Sunday across the province. Even today, feeling very fall like for most of us. Temperatures only reaching a high near nine degrees in St. John's. That's about five degrees below what we would normally see this time of year. Otherwise, we're seeing temperatures into the teens, 14 in Cornerbrook, nine in Happy Valley Goose Bay. And then we've got those temperatures in the single digits as well across uh, most portions of Labrador. Taking a look at the current satellite and radar, plenty of sunshine to the west, but we did see lots of cloud cover in the east tonight and as we uh, head through the next couple of days we're going to see the temperatures fluctuate just a little bit so we've got uh, we talked about the jet stream a lot last week and why we saw uh, those warmer temperatures now that cool pool uh, pool of air rather is going to move over us as we head into the middle of next week that's going to cool things down this will likely bring the first significant snowfall as well but I will have all of those details when I come back in a little bit Thanks, Ashley. Well, it's been nearly seven months since Justice Richard LeBlanc released his final report into the Muskrat Falls public inquiry. The latest revelation from that complex and costly process shows just how much lawyers charged and who's covering the tab. Terry Roberts has been digging into the numbers. He was the central figure in the Muskrat Falls inquiry, the so-called gatekeeper of the controversial hydro project that is billions over budget, years behind schedule. Now, he spent days had, on the witness stand. I've had this foolishness. I've had Mr. Martin. Some tense moments. Now, and when the commission it, delivered its findings, Ed Martin came in for some blistering criticism from Justice LeBlanc, including that he and others took unprincipled steps to get the project approved. Well, now the bills are in. And Nalcor reveals that it paid just under one million for Ed Martin's legal team, led by this man, veteran solicitor Harold Smith of the firm Stuart McKelvey. That's more than the annual salary paid to 10 senior classroom teachers in the province. And despite the fact Martin hasn't worked at Nalcor for more than four years, the Crown Corporation says it was obligated to pay his legal costs. In all, Nalcor spent nearly eight million on legal and professional services related to the inquiry with most of that going to McKinnis Cooper, 
the law firm that represented Nalcor throughout the nearly two-year process. Separately, the provincial government paid out more than $16 million in inquiry costs, nearly $3.5 million for two forensic audits, more than $2 million to this law firm and commission co-counsel Barry Learmonth. Learmonth billed at an hourly rate of $375. Other lawyers had their legal costs capped at $225 an hour, but many still topped the half-million-dollar mark in billings. All told, the cost to the province and Nalcor was roughly $24 million for an exercise that revealed some troubling findings about a project LeBlanc says was misguided and led by individuals willing to misrepresent costs, schedule and risk. So where does this go from here? Well, the RNC has confirmed it's assembled a team to investigate whether criminal charges can be pursued. The Department of Justice is also reviewing the inquiry report for potential civil litigation. Meanwhile, the public is still awaiting answers on what can be done to prevent electricity rates from doubling over the next couple of years. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, Chess Crosby will take the PC party into the next election. The Tories held their annual general meeting over the weekend. Crosby's leadership was supposed to go under review at the AGM, but party members quickly shot that down, deciding to keep him as leader. Crosby says he takes that as a rousing endorsement. I think it strengthens my hand as leader to know that I have the uh, backing of my party and of my caucus and of the district associations. It gives me the confidence to go forward and topple the Liberals. Now, in saying that, Crosby doesn't want the general election to happen right away. The current legislation requires an election between now and August. His party is calling for it to be delayed a year until October 2021. The Tories say it's about public safety, not the debt the party is in or their stance in the polls. New Brunswick safely held a provincial election last month, and Fury promised not to call an election this fall, but the opposition House leader David Brazel says with COVID, why risk it? I mean, we're all trying to promote democracy. You know, we, we've got an older population. We don't want to put anybody in any risk. I mean, we just saw what happened out in a by-election in Deerley, the potential, how that could have blew up just because we were cross, crossing paths with somebody who was coming in from out of the province. So until we got a full handle on how we continue to keep people safe, there's no reason that we should expose people to mass uh, movement when it's not necessary. A St. John's man wants stronger ATV enforcement after his dog was killed over the weekend. Terry Casey and his family are devastated by the loss of their beagle and they fear if something doesn't change soon, others may have more to mourn than just the loss of a pet. It's pretty clear that the Casey family are dog lovers. Three canines enjoy a nice fall day, but there used to be four in this furry family. While out hunting rabbits in the ghouls on Sunday, a father leading a group of young people on ATVs called Casey over. And so when I got out, of course, right away, he pointed to the road and um, my beagle was uh, hit by an ATV and left for dead on the side of the road. It was near Powers Road where the incident happened. The death of their seven-year-old beagle, Lucy, has shaken the entire Casey family. Devastating. They are my hunting companions. And I use them quite often, but um, it's devastating. Casey has been hunting for nearly 40 years, whether it's in the ghouls or at his cabin. He has no problem with ATV use as long as it's done properly and safely. I've seen zero enforcement. I've seen three enforcement officers in, three, in 38 years. On dirt roads like this, Casey sees children teens and even adults roaring up the road. These kids, they're driving on bikes that are 600, 800, 1,000 cc's. They're as much a death trap as anybody who's in a vehicle texting. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy how these kids drive these bikes. And I don't want to put an emphasis on kids, but the general population. Wally Collins represents the area on St. John's City Council. He and Casey agree that it's not just a problem in the ghouls, but it's behavior Collins has seen more of in recent years. Right now, the city has at least two complaints regarding ATV use in that area, something that needs to change. Well, obviously more enforcement. I mean, today it was my dog. Tomorrow, it's a kid 
or it's the kid's father who was out with them trying to teach them the proper ways of using an ATV, or it's the pedestrian that's walking up the street on these roads with their with their dogs. The Royal Newfoundland Constabulary says it's their responsibility to enforce the Highway Traffic Act when it comes to ATVs in areas like this one. Now, it encourages anybody who sees misuse of these all-terrain vehicles to report it to them right away, which is something that Casey says he's going to do. However, that is not going to bring back their family pet. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. RNC Constable Doug Snellgrove will stand trial for a third time on March 29th of next year. That date was set in Supreme Court this morning. About a dozen protesters stood outside expressing disappointment over the case's lengthy delay. Snellgrove was arrested in 2015, and in both of his trials, mistakes were made on the bench. One protester says those errors have made an impact. Six years of one case and having to wait again to have a third trial, it doesn't instill a lot of confidence in the community out there who looks to this building as a representation of justice and supporting those who are wronged. That is literally what the justice system is supposed to do, and it is not really putting forward its best case to prove that it's doing that. Well, a man in St. George's is facing several charges after shots were allegedly fired at a home. The RCMP issued a public warning for 34-year-old Todd Barry yesterday evening. As police were en route to the home, they received reports that Barry had left the scene and pointed a firearm at other people. Residents were asked to stay inside as RCMP officers and a dog unit searched the area. Officers found Barry driving an all-terrain vehicle with a passenger after about 40 minutes. According to police, Barry attempted to flee, but the ATV ended up in a ditch. He's facing 33 charges, including discharging a firearm at a residence and possession of a firearm while prohibited. In the end, no one was injured. Well, in other news tonight, the Innu Nation is going after restitution from Hydro-Quebec for damming the Churchill River. They say the Upper Churchill caused ecological and cultural damages and that it flooded ancestral lands. They're holding a press conference tomorrow to explain that plan. Well, the pandemic is taking its toll on cash-strapped service clubs in the province. Many are out a lot of money because of cancelled weddings and birthday parties and receptions that should have happened over the summer. Now, volunteers are scrambling to raise some cash, not for charitable causes, but just to pay the club's bills. Cease here reports. Members of the local classic rock cover band Cold Plates rehearse at the Elks Club for a fundraiser for the Elks Club a membership drive to get badly needed dollars in the door. Band member Colin Sims is a volunteer at the lodge and says the band is doing its part to help. I suggested that maybe Cold Plate would, would play uh, at no cost. That's your donation? That's our donation. Since March, revenue at the lodge is down 80%. We have been hit really hard by this pandemic. Uh, we're only open now three nights a week, uh, starting at four, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. They've had to cut some salaries, but Green says things are turning around, and they're optimistic. Events like trivia and karaoke will get people in. She says losing money is not an option. We have a plan, a strategic plan, to move forward in a way that, uh, and we're monitoring it every month. If we, if we start losing money, we have to... Um, change our focus or possibly close our doors so we're not going to we're not going to sink it's a similar story at the legion in pleasantville near kitty Vitty lake money is tight they've had no revenue for almost six months the three halls at the branch that are normally full with weddings and birthday parties sat empty from march until september we have monthly bills that we have to pay and a lot of our billers were very kind to us and they helped us out with a little bit but now we're back in business as of September 3rd and we're starting to, to get moving forward we have a few events booked this weekend so the momentum is starting to build there's momentum in Conception Bay North too following a few rocky months the Bacaloo Lions Club in Old Perligan revived bingo night using see-through plastic at their bingo tables uh, we had uh, purchased some stainless steel rod and created dividers to screw onto the tables and on that we've put barriers, uh, 
for clear barriers so that the, they can see each other still and, and talk back and forth, but they're set in basically their own little cube and, and they're, they're safe. Foote says they started bingo about four weeks ago and word is starting to get around. It's slow at first because the residents, uh, again, most of the residents that come to bingo are of the older generation and they were, they were concerned, of course, for their health and that. But slowly, Foote says, the 51 Lions Clubs under his direction from Gander to Pooch Cove are starting to see fundraising activity pick up again, and he hopes, like all service club members, it'll be enough. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. Well, what do you see in this photograph of Walla Walla onions? According to Facebook, there's some sexual behavior going on here, and it wants this local business to stop advertising. Stay tuned. Beautiful, but a little bit chilly evening out there. Things are gonna continue to be uh, cold for the next couple of days, and I'll have all of those details coming up.
We have some breaking news for you now. CBC has received word from a trusted source that North Atlantic refining is closing the come by chance oil refinery. This after an Irving deal to purchase the oil refinery fell through. There are 500 workers impacted by this news, not including contractors. Workers received a letter today from the company, which plans to continue operating the North Atlantic service stations. CBC will continue to monitor the story in the coming hours and days. This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. Take the time to explore this fall. Learn more at stayhomeyear.ca. All right, time for the weather. But before we get to that, Ashley, uh, Garrett Berry is on the road and uh, he has kindly pulled over on the side of the road to give us this live shot from Lancelou. Look at that. Tonight. Beautiful. Yeah, uh, great sunset. It, uh, it's that time of year. Hey, mm -hmm. we see those gorgeous sunsets, colorful skies. Uh, temperatures sitting around, I think it was six or seven degrees last time I checked there. So. A little bit of a chilly evening. Yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you, Garrett Perry, for uh, for setting that up for us. It's it's nice to see a shot from uh, that area for sure. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Temperatures, <laughs> uh, you know, cool in other places as well. And we saw a pretty summery start to the weekend, though. This is some of the rainfall totals. Uh, if you remember from Friday night into Saturday, we did see a lot of rain on the Avalon. Uh, 70, 50 to 70 millimeters. It was uh, what we saw the most of. There's those uh, numbers there, about 47 here in St. John's by the time we woke up on Saturday morning. But yes, temperatures are much different. Only uh, sitting around 8 degrees right now in St. John's. Temperature near 6 in Terranova and then into the teens through Corner Brook. 13 degrees. Happy Valley Goose Bay sitting at about 8 right now as well. So taking a look at satellite radar, we are starting to lose that sun. So we're going to lose the radar picture there in a little bit. There it is. Uh, rather the satellite, but it is still very much cloudy and will continue to be cloudy for the next couple of hours. Might even see a few showers as well. But as we head through the overnight tonight, things should clear out for the most part, certainly in the east and then be a, a quiet chilly night for most of us. Some showers working their way towards uh, southeastern portions of Labrador and maybe the tip of the northern peninsula as well. Otherwise, not a whole lot going on. Uh, we'll see some showers move in as we head towards the morning hours, though, on the west coast as well. Here's where our temperatures will be sitting. Three to five degrees for most of us. Generally light winds under these cool, calm conditions. Some of those lower lying areas will more than likely sit below zero. Uh, Badger being one of them or Grand Falls winds are being one of them. Minus four tonight is your overnight low. One in Happy Valley Goose Bay, zero in Lab City with those winds generally light uh, for most of us. But uh, we're looking at about 15 to 20 kilometers millimeter per hour winds up through portions of Labrador as well. Now tomorrow we'll see those showers make their way towards the west coast. The afternoon's actually looking pretty beautiful for most of us, uh, certainly in the east. Plenty of sunshine on tap. Showers will work their way across the big land as well. Through northern portions of uh, Labrador, you'll probably wake up to a wet snow or some flurries and that'll change over to rain uh, through the afternoon. And there's that potential for some showers, certainly into the evening hours on uh, Tuesday night and into Wednesday along the West Coast. So temperatures tomorrow will be uh, generally in the 10 to 14 degree range. Winds will be light in the east and then we're going to see them pick up as the day goes on in the west. So southwesterlies 20 to 40 kilometers per hour and gradually more cloud cover as you head west as well. And then up through Labrador generally staying in that teen uh, range for southeastern portions of the big land and then we're looking at single digit temperatures pretty much for the rest. Again, those winds will ramp up. We're looking at uh, south southwesterlies somewhere between 40 to as much as 60 kilometers per hour. Now into Wednesday, we are going to see more rain. Special weather statement in effect right now for the southwestern portion of the island. We're going to see periods of rain that will be heavy at times through the day on Wednesday and then continuing into Thursday as well as an area of low pressure moves in. But note this uh, blue that's starting to show up. That's snow. It's going to wrap around some of that colder air with it. Uh, certainly into Thursday, Wednesday night into Thursday afternoon. Just how far south that snow makes it, uh, we'll have to figure that out at this point. But it is looking like we'll see the first accumulation anyway, uh, Thursday night, Wednesday night into Thursday as well. So here's the temperatures. A little bit of a jump up in the temperatures for the island, uh, 13 to 15, even 16 degrees. We'll 
hang on to that sunshine at least through the first half of the day in the east, but that rain will make its way uh, further uh, east through the day. 13 degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Same thing for Cartwright and then Lab City. You're going to sit at the four degree range, but again, potential to see some flurries certainly into the evening hours into Thursday. That's when we start to see the winds ramp up in the morning and then eventually into the evening as well with periods of rain continuing for most of us, but another day in the teens as well. So 15 to 16 degrees and then there's those cooler temperatures I was talking about. So Nain uh, back down to two Lab City minus one. So that's where we're going to see the majority of the snowfall for that. But then as we head into the weekend, temperatures start to dip back down again. So back into those single digits, uh, both Friday and Saturday with these windy conditions sticking around as well. It is going to be fairly windy for the next little bit uh, for central Newfoundland. Note your temperatures dipping overnight uh, Friday. We could see a few flurries. Uh, with that as well, certainly uh, through western Newfoundland, even in the Long Range Mountains, we could see uh, some flurries certainly uh, for the weekend, but overall temperatures will be sitting into those single digits eventually back up to about uh, 10 by Saturday, but it is still very fall like uh, for eastern Labrador. There's your temperatures into the uh, single digits by the weekend and overnight lows dipping into those minus uh, minus single digits as well. Certainly Friday night again that potential for some flurries for Happy Valley Goose Bay as well or light snow. And then for Lab West, uh, it's looking like mainly flurries will be the story for you as we head towards the weekend. I wanted to share this shot. Look at this waves crashing in CBS. Jonathan shared this beautiful, dramatic shot with us. If you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. There are many layers to an onion, and when you peel them off, there is an erotic vegetable right here, which has got our next guest, Jackson McLean here at Gay's Seed into a bit of trouble. What kind of store are you running here? <laughs> Just a garden store. We sell seeds, soil, supplies, nothing sexual. Now, Facebook has a problem with what you're holding in your hand there. These Walla Walla onions, uh, I guess, depending on how you look at it, you might see things as if it's some kind of psychiatric test. <laughs> what's what's Facebook's problem? Uh, well, we got notified the other day that it's an overtly sexual image that they had to ban from the site, <laughs> unfortunately. I guess something about the two round shapes there could be misconstrued as, as boobs or right. <laughs> something yeah. nude and in I some guess, way. I guess the way they're all kind of jumbled together on top of each other might suggest something else. I, I, I have no <laughs> idea. So what was your reaction when you said, what did Facebook send you? They sent me a, I guess it was an error that we couldn't boost the post. Like we, we pay Facebook for advertising and we wanted to advertise this because we sell it for the spring. Yeah. And they told us that they can't allow us to advertise it because it's against their policies. Right. So we had to choose another image or uh, appeal the decision. Okay, so it's the actual picture of the Walla Walla onion that got you in trouble, right? Just the photo, yeah. All right. So. Obviously, Facebook must have some kind of algorithm that looks at pictures like what you're holding right there yeah. and comes to all kinds of odd conclusions. What was your reaction? What would you think? Uh, I just thought it was funny. <laughs> like, you'd have to have a pretty active imagination to look at that and get something sexual out of it. Yeah, and not a lot of experience. <laughs> no. But um, I guess the, the one thing is that it says it's overtly sexual or overly sexual? Overtly. Overtly sexual. Yeah. Yeah, as in there's no way of mistaking it as not sexual. Who knew? <laughs> I, I know you posted uh, that you found this kind of funny on Facebook. Any reaction from, from some of your customers? I mean, who knew? Yeah, a lot of people said they didn't get it, so I actually did a little mock-up of what I thought they could be seeing with the, the shapes and uh, a yeah. few different images behind that they might have been imagining. Okay, well, it's a family show, so I want to ask you to share those. <laughs> yeah. But uh, any chance that Facebook's going to send you a note saying uh, we, we kind of goofed? Uh, well, we appealed the decision, so hopefully an actual human gets to look at the photo and gets to decide that it's not actually sexual at all. It's just onions. And, and ironically, you pay Facebook for advertising, but you might get more publicity from this than the actual <laughs> Facebook ad. That's true, yeah. <laughs> Listen, Jackson, uh, appreciate your time. Uh, I've learned a lot about the potential sexual appeal of onions, I suppose, and uh, good luck getting Facebook on the right track. Thank you. Face masks are mandatory, but for those working in the high-risk, low-wage service industry, who should pay for the PPE? The employer or the employee? Prajwala Digzit will explore that question coming up.
Well, masks have become our new normal, but if you have to wear a mask at work as part of your job, who pays for it? You or your employer? The CBC's Prajwala Digit is looking into that for us. So Prajwala, what did you find out? Uh, I focus specifically on the service industry for this, uh, Carolyn, uh, particularly restaurants and bars. They're higher risk and typically lower pay. Minimum wage currently sits at $12.15 an hour, and a good reusable mask runs anywhere between $10 and $20. So that's practically an hour's pay or more uh, for someone who's working minimum wage. That's right, exactly. And that's why some workers feel masks should be supplied by their employers. The mask thing is useful. You see somebody at a table and they could have flu-like symptoms and you still have to serve them because it's like my job. There are older people in my life and immunocompromised people in my life that, you know, I need to worry about. And even growing up, I had asthma, so like that kind of weighed on my brain when all of this started happening and like I was still at work and like maybe something could go awry and like somebody in my life would be affected by that. So Peter Lannan, who works at Bannerman Brewing uh, that we just heard right now, told me some days when he gets home from work, he aggressively washes up, afraid that he's caught COVID. He says working through the pandemic is hurting his mental health. And a mask, he says, helps with that by easing his worries about the transmission of the virus. Okay, and it certainly hasn't been an easy time for restaurants and bars these past few months. Absolutely not. I mean, uh, our province is, is special in that sense. We got hit twice, not once, and first by snowmageddon, then by the COVID lockdown. Now they're operating at half capacity, and there are extra labor and sanitization costs. Some businesses I spoke with told me that's why they're getting their employees to buy their own masks. Okay, so is there any regulation on this, um, something that says who should be paying for the masks? So at the moment, there's no specific occupational health and safety regulation around who's responsible for providing masks in the workplace. In a statement, the Department of Health said, and I quote, individuals are encouraged to obtain and use their own personal masks for daily use. Anyone who is unable to obtain their own personal masks for use in the workplace should speak to their supervisor or employer to discuss possible solutions. So to clarify this, I spoke to an occupational health and safety consultant as well. His name's Colin Legro, and he says employers have to make sure staff are reasonably safe. The question with COVID is whether workplaces are any more dangerous than other places that you would normally visit. Is the exposure any different between at home or at the workplace? If it's magnified at the workplace, well, then the employer has a general responsibility in order to protect against that. And the employee also has a responsibility to be involved with that process. Mr. Legro says COVID is a financial burden on everybody, and it's going to take teamwork to pull through this. In Bannerman Brewing's case, they're supplying staff with a custom reusable mask and however many disposable masks possible. The owner says safety is important and he wouldn't want to pass the financial burden to any of his staff. All right, Prajwala Digit, thank you so much for this. Thank you, Carolyn. You're welcome. Well, a lot of interest today in what happens when world leaders get COVID-19. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says that he was recently tested. Earlier in September, I had a bit of a, uh, a bit of a throat tickle is probably the best way I could say it, a bit of a, a raspy throat. Um, so I checked with my doctor and he recommended I get tested. Uh, I got tested, uh, it was negative. Um, and uh, I, uh, I went back to work uh, a few days later when the, when the doctor told me uh, I was clear to do it. Now, Trudeau also acknowledged today the growing number of COVID-19 cases in both Ontario and Quebec. He repeated that even if most Canadians can't be together for Thanksgiving, there is still a chance to reflatten the curve before Christmas. Well, 35,274,000 people around the world have COVID-19 and over 1,038,000 have died. Only four countries exceed the 1 million mark for cases of infection. The United States, India, Brazil and Russia. The United States is the worst affected with more than 7.4 million infections, but India's numbers are closing in on that figure. The U.S. also has the highest death toll with nearly 210,000 fatalities. The world's most populous nation, China, where the virus was first detected, reports under 91,000 infections. 
That's lower than Canada and fewer than in Guatemala and the Dominican Republic, all countries with just a fraction of China's population. A couple hundred families will get help with food this Thanksgiving because of a weekend food drive. An auto body shop in Mount Pearl heard that Bridges to Hope was struggling to keep up with demand and staff decided to host a donation drive through We went down there and see how empty the pantry was and I was a little, it tugged on my heartstrings so I wanted to do a food drive and here we are. It was non-stop traffic from the time we began. Uh, Actually, even after we ended, still people were still coming 20 minutes after. But I tell you, a success is an understatement. It was absolutely overwhelming to see how many people came out today. As you can see, we have quite a load of food here. This truck's completely full. Another truck load of food over there, and we have thousands of dollars in money raised also. So it's great going into Thanksgiving and as much needed. You can always count on the people in Newfoundland to stick together, and it's times like this when they really do. U.S. President says he will head back to the White House this evening, just three days after being hospitalized for COVID-19. 
Though he may not entirely be out of the woods yet, the team and I agree that all our evaluations, and most importantly, his clinical status, support the President's safe return home, where he'll be surrounded by world-class medical care 24-7. In a tweet this afternoon, Donald Trump said he's feeling good and suggested people should not be afraid of COVID. Meanwhile, the White House press secretary is the latest among a dozen people in Trump's inner circle to test positive for the virus. Also, medical experts are criticizing Trump's decision to greet supporters from a motorcade near the military hospital yesterday. They say he endangered the health of the people in the vehicle with him. The United States remains the nation hardest hit by COVID-19. It has more than 7.4 million cases and 210,000 deaths. The new leader of the Green Party held a news conference today after winning the leadership over the weekend. Anime Paul talked about what she'll focus on, climate change, obviously, which she called the existential crisis of our times, but also the response to COVID-19. We have a social safety net that has let people down and has let peeping, people fall through. I mentioned that my father died in long-term care. He's one of thousands of Canadians who died unnecessarily because the government and the previous governments dropped the ball. And uh, if we don't fix that problem, then more people will die in this next wave that we're about, to, that's, that we're, that's hit us, really. And so long-term care, universal pharmacare, guaranteed livable income, these are the policies that we need to have in place as soon as possible if we are going to protect everyone and allow them to live in dignity. The first order of business for Anime Paul is to win a seat in Parliament. She plans to run in Toronto Centre in a by-election on October 26th. The seat was vacated by former Finance Minister Bill Morneau. Quebec is launching a public inquiry into the death of an Indigenous woman who faced racist abuse in a hospital during her final hours. <laughs> We've been following the story of Joyce Eshaquan, who posted a live video from her hospital bed one week ago. She was pleading for help, insulted and ridiculed by a nurse. There was immediate outrage, and over the weekend, protesters gathered in Montreal and Quebec City calling for justice for Joyce. Antoni Nezretent has more. If the human wave, uh, I mean, grows and remains strong enough, eventually we'll, we'll be able to knock down those walls, you know, at, at the political level. Public outrage in Quebec this weekend after an Indigenous woman went public with her deathbed humiliation. <laughs> Joyce Echequan recorded herself during a hospital stay in Joliette, north of Montreal. You can hear staff making racist remarks and calling the Atikamek woman stupid. A nurse and an orderly have since been fired, but the video sparked an outcry that led to protest in Montreal that drew thousands. Fresh off organizing that protest, Nagouset says the government's public inquiry into Echequan's death is an important victory. Because it's not an inquiry on everyone, it's on one specific case that is making an example, a concrete example of why systemic racism is so wrong. In a statement, the Atikamek Council of Manawan said that, along with Eshaquan's family, it welcomes the public inquiry. The council says community members had already spoken out about the racism and abuse they experienced at Joliet Hospital, but that nothing has changed. I would really like the, uh, the, the protest to continue every single day in every uh, different province. Although it was not as big of a turnout, people gathered in Toronto. I think I have like seen it all in uh, over 30 years of doing this work and then something like this happens and I realize no, you know. In a statement, Premier Francois Legault said it's his government's duty to ensure everyone is treated equally, but he stopped short of doing what many say he must do, acknowledge that systemic racism exists in Quebec. Anthony Nerestan, CBC News, Montreal. Well, I've been talking about the lack of this radar in the east all summer. Coming up, I'll talk to David Neal about what's going on.
meteorologists and weather enthusiasts alike missed the Holyrood weather radar this summer. I know I certainly did. David Neal is a meteorologist with Environment Canada and joins me now from Gander. So, David, our eye to the sky, so to speak, has been offline for months now. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes, well, this is part of a, a national initiative uh, with the Meteorological Service of Canada. Uh, we're replacing all of the weather radars across the country. So this summer it was the turn for Holyrood radar to be uh, updated. So you say update. So what are some of the new features that this radar is going to have? Well, one of the biggest ones for our purposes will be uh, uh, what's uh, called a dual polarization. So right now the current radar, at least the old radar, um, it could only uh, transmit and receive pulses in the horizontal. This one will be able to do it in horizontal and vertical. And what that's going to allow us to do, we'll be able to uh, better distinguish between the different precipitation particles. So it will be able to distinguish better between rain, snow, hail, freezing rain. So we'll have a better idea of, uh, especially when we have changing phases or uh, when there's different precipitation types involved, we'll be able to pinpoint those areas a little more easily. It'll also be able to uh, better distinguish between meteorological targets like precipitation versus non-meteorological targets like, say, insects, birds, any sort of uh, clutter that may be in the area. A couple of the other ones, uh, the, the radar will have more power. It will be able to uh, see deeper into uh, different storm cells. And uh, the old radars uh, required uh, six times a year uh, maintenance. The new radars will, uh, will only require uh, twice a year regular maintenance. So more time, uh, more time operational. So the other thing I noticed was uh, over the years, I mean, I've only been here for a couple of years, but over the years noticed that there's a lot of blind spots with the radar if you get down into the Buren Peninsula. How will this radar improve that? Uh, well, it's, uh, the radar is going to stay in, in the same place, so still in Holyrood. That uh, was uh, deemed to be the best location to really reduce those number of, uh, of blind spots in the east. It may not necessarily really reduce those, but it was deemed to be the best site really to see in all directions around the Avalon Peninsula. And that's, that's usually important for eastern Newfoundland, uh, especially in the wintertime. Uh, we do get those storms that form off the east coast of the U.S. Once they get off of there, there's not a whole lot of data that we can really go on uh, before they really approach Newfoundland. And so having that uh, Holy Roo radar and really being able to see offshore is very important for forecasting, for, uh, particularly for eastern Newfoundland. Yeah, especially now that we're getting into these winter months now. So how long do we have until this is live and what has been the uh, situation thus far? Uh, we're doing uh, a, a, a bit of site, what we call site acceptance testing uh, next week, so starting October 5th. It shouldn't be too long after that. It'll either be later in that work week or early in the following work week. So we're looking worst case scenario. It should be up on our uh, different platforms uh, by uh, middle of uh, the Thanksgiving week. That's very exciting. I'm sure I share that sentiment with a lot of people. So we have another radar, Marble Mountain. When uh, is that going to get an upgrade? That will also be upgraded. We're doing all the radars across the country. You're looking at uh, a little more than, uh, uh, you're looking at quite a number of radars. We can only really do, I guess, sort of five or six uh, really per year, usually around six or so. Marble Mountain will be uh, is tentatively scheduled for 2022. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Great, thank you for having me. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, the other thing to note too is before we would only get a return every 10 minutes. So this uh, new update will give us a, a return every six minutes. So it's really hmm. good in storm situations. And uh, it should also be up by hopefully the middle of next week. So uh, fingers crossed that continues. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot less maintenance too to keep it going. That's right. So hopefully it won't be down as often as it was. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I got to chill up my spine when we were looking at all those pictures of the snow. <laughs> it's <laughs> not that far away. <laughs> it's no. not. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. Good night. Good night.